Hello, my friends, and welcome to the 102nd episode of Patterson in Pursuit. Got a really interesting episode for you today. So here's a question. Does scientific progress look like a very straightforward accumulation of knowledge? There's a big old pile of knowledge, and year after year, we just keep adding more and more knowledge over time, and eventually we have this wonderful mountain of knowledge. Or does a science and scientific progress go through ebbs and flows? Do we gain knowledge and then potentially lose knowledge? And is there any difference between gaining theoretical knowledge to improve our understanding of the world versus gaining technical knowledge or engineering knowledge, the ability to manipulate the world in ways that we prefer? Are these the same types of knowledge or are they different areas? Now, if you guys have been listening to my show for a while or following my work, you know, I tend to be rather skeptical when it comes to the contemporary paradigms in which we live. I think a lot of ideas really aren't resolved at the foundational level. This is true in philosophy, seems to be true in a bunch of areas of science, maybe even engineering, and to my shock and horror, even something like mathematics. So I tend to see our contemporary academic system as not producing particularly high quality knowledge. But there's this interesting thing here, which is we seem to still be making engineering progress and some type of scientific knowledge, even if maybe the fundamentals aren't sorted out, we still seem to be progressing along some dimensions. So how is that possible? How could it be that both the fundamentals of various disciplines are not sorted out and are maybe completely wrong, and the experts in those domains don't even understand the fundamentals of their disciplines, and yet we still seem to make scientific and engineering pro uh, progress. These are the types of questions I'm discussing with Dr. Jeff Anders today. Jeff is an excellent philosopher and a research program designer who's the founder and executive director of Leverage Research, which is an independent research organization located in the Bay Area. He's currently studying early stage science. In this conversation, Jeff brings up the concept of intellectual shelling points, which is a really neat idea to explain how researchers can coordinate on a particular topic, even if maybe the fundamentals of that topic aren't quite sorted out in a perfectly logically rigorous way. Shelling points are uh, an idea that comes from game theory and recently, I've been hearing a lot of people talking about shelling points in the Bitcoin world, which is unfortunate because generally when Bitcoiners talk about shelling points, they kind of abuse the idea and it's not, they don't port the concept smoothly from game theory into uh, Bitcoin. But this is actually a great application of it, and I'm sure you guys will enjoy it. Though I tend to be more skeptical and pessimistic with regards to contemporary and maybe historical scientific knowledge, Jeff makes a bunch of good points and is significantly less pessimistic than I am and argues that things are in fact trending the right direction over time. So I hope you guys really enjoy my conversation with Dr. Jeff Anders. All right, Mr. Jeff Anders, thanks so much for coming on Patterson in Pursuit today. Can't wait to talk with you. Thanks for having me, Steve. I'm excited for the conversation as well. So I just want to jump right in. And I know you've been doing a lot of research on the philosophy of science and the history of science. And I want to give you an, uh, a, a bad idea that I used to hold. I think a lot of people used to believe. And tell me what you think about it and tell me maybe why you think this is, uh, this is incorrect. Sure. So it, the, the story maybe that people inherit growing up and thinking about science is that scientific progress is linear, that, that there's over a period of time, there's just pure accumulation of knowledge. We didn't know something and then we know a little bit more and then we build on it and we know a little bit more and we know a little bit more and it just yep. keeps going that way indefinitely. And yep. that's, that's, I, I remember thinking that and, and just kind of, I don't know, g gathering that maybe from our culture and maybe explicit education. But the more I've learned myself, I'm thinking, okay, that story is definitely uh, incorrect for a bunch of reasons I have suspicions about. But what do you think? What do you think about that story? I think that as, as far as a really simplified story, it's like not completely terrible <laughs> um, because it's, it's absolutely the case that in, you know, one would have to figure out how to quantify across disciplines and so forth. But I think sort of on any fair measure, 
we're at the absolute height of scientific knowledge and technological uh, sort of skill. Um, and uh, so I think there's definitely a sense in which there has been sort of like really solid progress. But then there are a couple things that I think are sort of wrong about this story. So the first, the most basic thing is that if, um, so sometimes we lose knowledge. This is a thing that happens. Um, there's a number of different interesting cases. One of my favorite cases is the Anakithra mechanism. Um, you may be familiar with this, um, but you know, essentially the, um, you know, around 1900, some, you know, archaeologists found, you know, people, there's a shipwreck off the coast of the Greek island of Anakithra. They found, you know, a bunch of regular sort of ancient Greek artifacts and then this crusted gearbox. Mm -hmm. And they sort of left it on the shelf, didn't really worry about it. And then, you know, a number of years later, someone was like, wait a second, gears, hold on. And so they went through and they x-rayed the thing and they found out that it was actually really substantially advanced, that it was essentially um, a geared mechanism with tons of gears and you put in a crank and you turn it and then it would keep track of the relative positions of the sun, moon, the planets, as well as the timing for the Olympic Games. And the whole thing had an essentially an instruction sort of thing uh, sort of etched onto a plate. And then there's nothing of this level of technological sophistication for like many hundreds of years. Like this is, you know, um, you know, over a thousand years. And so this is an example where you think, okay, well, that's crazy. There's this super advanced artifact relative to the time. And then more than a thousand year stretch where we have nothing like it. Okay. This means that it's not the case that there's simply straightforward accumulation. Right. Okay, so that's like the sort of first thing that I'd point out. And there's lots more to say about the Anakithra mechanism. It's a super cool example. Um, another thing that is wrong about the really simple model of knowledge accumulation, um, you can see this sort of embedded in a lot of the histories where when you go back and you look at something like the history of our knowledge of infectious disease um, or... Um, the history of electricity, for example. What frequently, when you look at a history, you have essentially like the simplest version of a history is like a timeline. And then there's the first time anyone ever noticed that something that we now know to be true was true. Well, the problem with this is that in a lot of cases, people figure things out and then those things just don't get adopted. Right where they get adopted by a couple people and then the relevant sort of pocket of, of knowledge dies out. And so then this is, uh, but so then in addition to there being sort of uh, things being lost, um, you also have plenty of cases where people are making discoveries and then the discoveries don't end up get uh, getting added to the total pool of knowledge until substantially later. Right. It seems to me that there's uh, there's a, a domain of knowledge which is like engineering and technical knowledge, and then there's the thing yeah. I'm really interested in, which is more theoretical knowledge. And, sure. And and these tracks also seem to diverge. That sometimes you get engineering progress when maybe you don't get theoretical progress. Maybe sometimes you get theoretical progress, you don't get engineering progress. And so when I think of the uh, the Greek mechanism. This is yeah. this really fascinating case where you have engineering that was lost, uh, knowledge that was lost. Sure. Like that, that seems remarkable because you think the, there would be more incentives aligned to preserve that type of knowledge. You could understand some esoteric theory be, being forgotten and then it gets recovered. But to think that we have concrete mechanical technical knowledge that just gets destroyed is amazing. Yeah. Well, let's see. So there's a number of questions there. Um, so... Right now, I think that in a lot of cases where you see societies losing some of their engineering capacity, um, there's, in some cases, you have civilizational disruption as the sort of cause. Mm. In other cases, you have not so much civilizational disruption as you have um, uh, society changing its interests. So I wrote a piece recently that talks about the um, Rocketdyne F1 engine. Um, completely love the example. Uh, essentially, you have 
Um, the Air Force wants a huge rocket, a contract Rocketdyne. Air Force actually loses interest, but NASA comes in, and then Rocketdyne ends up building these F-1 engines, which are these absolutely enormous engines that end up being used on the Saturn V. So these are the engines that took us to the moon. So then the there's you know if you look online you'll find there's a bunch of you know, videos and articles and discussion and so forth on the topic of can we still build the F1 rocket or the F1 engine and if we can't build the F1 engine maybe this means that we've lost um, uh, we've lost you know important knowledge and so forth and and how could that be the case you know given the fact that this is so recent people are like completely shocked at the proposal that we couldn't just rebuild the thing that took us to the moon. Um, and then if you like dig deeper into the actual details of the case, I, I think what you find is that, um, you know, so first of all, the crazy thing about the F ones is that they were essentially handmade. Um, so you have a very large number of very skilled welders mm. um, or engineers doing all of these complex individual welds and essentially handcrafting the rockets. In the intervening time, there's all these technological advances. Um, there's then much less incentive to produce uh, nearly as many skilled engineers. And a lot of the people who worked on the original F1s have retired. And so what you end up with is sort of technology moves on. Mm. This changes the uh, sort of which skilled people get produced. Um, and so then it becomes hard to reproduce the original engine in this case. That... Um, that's not exactly a sort of real loss of knowledge because we now, you know, the company Rocketdyne made designs for a more advanced, um, a more advanced engine. It's never actually been produced, uh, but it would be the sort of thing that we could make using laser welding and machine tools and all the stuff that's been developed over the last, you know, 50 years. Um, the, but it's interesting because you can imagine what happens if we as a civilization, like there's a way in which we're less interested in space now than we were in the past. Um, it's not that we're opposed to space exploration. We have Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos, and we just really hope that they succeed at what they're trying to do. Um, but you just have so much less sort of uh, a much smaller share of the GDP. There's just much less total societal support and you could imagine that if you know elon and bezos go pick up different hobbies or something like that and then the industry continues to change for a while you might imagine that then we lose the ability to even be able to manufacture the things and so and this this happened with rome and roman concrete where the romans had this really interesting form of concrete that gets stronger as you leave it in salt water Modern concrete is nothing like this. When you think of things like the um, Pantheon um, or the Colosseum, you've got these concrete structures that um, are, they've been around for a long time and they look really solid. If you imagine making anything like that out of modern concrete, you imagine that thing starts to crumble. And mm -hmm. okay, so this, well, what's happening is they're making it out of this special form of concrete. But then it's, you know, it's interesting The you had a bunch of these different um, a bunch of these uh, sort of capacities for manufacturing concrete. And then people stopped building the relevant structures. So if you had fall of Rome, fall of you know central support, people still use concrete in some ways, but essentially over the course of many hundreds of years, you just end up with less and less and less support for large centralized projects, at which point people then stop understanding how to uh, like, basically how to construct the large buildings. You could imagine the same sort of thing happening with rockets. Mm -hmm. So another interesting fact about this is when you're talking about the, the rocket uh, yeah. scenario, that wasn't that long ago. I mean, good heavens, that was what, 60, 70 years ago? Not, not even that long? Yeah, late 60s, early 70s. <laughs> yeah, like when they were building that. So yeah. th to think that that kind of knowledge degradation can happen in a short period of time is remarkable to think over long periods of time if if those engineers died out you might legitimately forever lose um those relevant pieces of knowledge it also makes me think that something mm -hmm. i'm continually learning is that there are different there are dramatically different types of knowledge 
When you're talking about uh, theoretical knowledge that can be captured in a book or an instruction manual, that's one type of knowledge that can be made explicit and, and maybe transferred to other people. But there's this other yeah. category of knowledge, which is the implicit knowledge. The stuff that you, it's, it's, it's the, the engineers know, they have a bunch of knowledge that they never put into the blueprints that they right. just kind of poured around that they can share amongst the, the others in their class. Yes. Um, but it, it never gets made explicit. And that seems like that's the type of knowledge that can be extremely easily lost is when there's a, some group of people that has tacit knowledge and then for whatever reason, they aren't building the thing anymore or they die out or funding dries up, that kind of thing. Yeah, so, I mean, I think it's interesting. I think you can measure what a civilization cares about by looking at its words. Um, so, like, for example, the Romans had all of these different words for power, and the Greeks had all of these different words for knowledge. Um, we don't have as many words for knowledge. Um, we do have an almost unlimited number of words for sending short messages. Mm. So it's like, Slacking, DMing, texting, you know, et cetera. Um, <laughs> and you could just list tons of those. And that's because I think as a civilization, we are completely amazing with regard to sending short messages. You could imagine someone, you know, well, of course you wouldn't send them a Slack message. You should send them a text message in this circumstance. Right, right. Um, so we've got sophistication as a civilization on a particular type of communication but then the Greeks really cared about knowledge. And so then they had a whole bunch of different words for knowledge like they had. Um, so there's episteme, which refers to third person transferable knowledge, the sort of uh, explicit um, objective, et cetera. Uh, then they had techne, which refers to technical knowledge or know-how. We have a word for that. And then they had sophia. Uh, which refers to wisdom, a particular type of theoretical wisdom. There's also gnosis, there's phronesis. Phronesis is practical wisdom, and there's no natural translation for that word in English. Um, but yeah, it's interesting. When you think about the preservation and decay of knowledge, um, the easiest thing to preserve is the episteme, the mm -hmm. um, explicit, uh, easier, to, you know, you can write it down sort of knowledge. Whereas I think in a lot of cases, knowledge traditions are based around techne. You have a whole bunch of people who know how to do a particular thing. Mm -hmm. And then they lose the ability to, it's very hard to completely communicate that. In fact, in a lot of cases, and this is something that I think relates to the history of science in general and something I think is underappreciated. Nowadays, when people think about the acquisition of scientific knowledge, when you said you're really interested in the theoretical knowledge, well, the theoretical knowledge itself frequently historically actually comes after you've developed a whole bunch of techne. So you end up with an engineering capacity first before you end mm -hmm. up with a lot of knowledge of what's going on. Mm -hmm. So like a, a good example here is going to be chemistry, where prior to chemistry, you have the alchemists and a bunch of the alchemists are doing something really weird, but a bunch of the other alchemists are essentially working on figuring out how to break down rocks and materials and so forth into the relevant elements as they're doing this they're getting a whole bunch of knowledge of how to work with materials and then that knowledge ends up being really helpful but this is something that you get before you get to theoretical knowledge right I, this is there's an interesting <laughs> parallel here just in philosophy which is the discussion between uh, experience and theory so what comes first? Do you have a theory and then you go out and experience the world through that theory? Or do you gain a bunch of experiences mm -hmm. and then after the fact, you think about mm -hmm. all those experiences and you construct yeah. a theory to try to explain them? Yeah, I mean, I, I, well, I think that it's, it's a delicate and complex matter. It's extremely difficult to look at the world without having a whole bunch of concepts in your lens, so to speak. When you look at the world as the idea of theory ladenness of observation, you will see the world as behaving in a way where you'll, you'll see it with a layer of a sort of interpretation added. Uh, my favorite example of this comes from philosophy is the idea of causation. So, you know, if you see one billiard ball roll along and hit another billiard ball, and the other billiard ball rolls away, you think, okay, I just saw causation, um, but 
that's not actually true. Um, if you pay close attention to what you see, you see one motion, you hear a noise, you see another motion, you see a sequence, you don't actually see the causation, you don't perceive it. This is a point made by David Hume, and one of the few things that's largely accepted by philosophers, of course, some philosophers disagree, but it's really interesting because then whenever you look at things and think that you see one thing is causing another, yeah. what's actually happening is you're adding interpretation. Okay, but this is true generally. Yeah, yeah. And so, and so then in it's, and the way I think about this is that there's a relation between observation instrument and theory where normally people, the sort of simple view is that you have you sort of experience, you know, maybe people don't take into account theory ladenness. They think they just have the experiences and then they observe a bunch of things and then they build a theory and then they go and they, the theory makes various predictions and then they go and they test it by making further observations. I think that certainly happens. That's only one really small part of the picture. Actually, I think what there is is a bidirectional relation between theory, instrument, and observation. So you get um, the, you start off with a theory. You think that you don't, you're wrong, you've got a theory, it's in the background. <laughs> you go, you make a bunch of observations. Uh, the observations then inform the development of the theory. But if you're really serious about making observations, then in a lot of cases you'll develop instruments to help you to make observations. Mm. And notably, the, well, the instruments help you to make more observations, but also the observations help you to refine your instruments. You're, you're there trying to observe some phenomenon and your instrument is giving you weird readings in some area. Well, okay, the weird reading is an observation, but then you fiddle with your instrument to make it better. Mm -hmm. And so the refinement of the instrument in response to observation, that happens. And then your theories tell you to build certain instruments, but also sometimes you end up with instruments that you don't know why they work. And then you have to build theories in order to help with that. Right. Okay, and so, so I, I want anyway, to unpack this yeah. a little bit. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, so just to digress a little bit. Um, so I've got my premium ginger ale here. Uh, this is yeah. a, it's not it's not alcoholic ginger beer. And yeah. I always like to use props whenever, so anything that's close by, I always grab. So just to highlight the point about this relationship between theory and experience, because it's essential. Sure. Most people, I think, prior to examination, operate within the realm of their own theories and they they their theories are so strong that they they almost lack access to the the real texture of their own experience so uh, so people would say oh what's happening right now well there is a there is a bottle of uh, premium ginger brew that is being held in my hand well how do i know it's right, right there i see it they right. don't they that's like one that they're mistaking their theory for their experience if i'm actually yeah telling you about my experience. Well, there is a green color, color blob right here with a lot of, like, the yellow color blobs and this red color blob. And here's this peach color blob. I call all of these, well, this is my arm, this is my hand, this is a bottle. I, yeah. co I construct a theory. Not, I'm yeah. not rationally sitting down and thinking, like I'm not explicitly writing out whenever I experience a green color blob that is this way, it is a right, bottle. Right. It's just this theory that gets constructed in the background that sometimes you can even lose access to because you get lost. It's such a compelling theory. You don't even realize sure. that it's a theory anymore. Yeah, I completely agree with this. In fact, it's actually really hard to, so there's a, first of all, a technical question about whether the mind is capable at all of accessing experience without interpreting that experience through a concept. Yeah. Um, that's the thing. The next thing I was yeah. going to ask you. But, well, yeah. So I mean, yeah. Kant, Kant says you can't do it, and I'm in Kant's camp in this regard. Um, I, my current models of the human mind um, include that it's not possible to uh, have. Um, it, it's not possible to cognitively access experience that you're not conceptualizing. Um, now, you know, is that actually true? Um, you, this is a part of. 
Yeah, also, like pure awareness. If I would say, if, if I'm trying to be honest and I, and I cease the well, naming and labeling function. Pure you know. awareness, I mean, that's, that, that's a further matter because, you know, you, there's a question of do you mean pure awareness or do you mean awareness of an experience or awareness of the sensations, right? So you've got your bottle yeah. and you were talking in a sort of sense data type language where you're like, there's a green color blob and so forth. Yeah. Okay. But does pure awareness involve a green color blob? Like, you know... Um, so it's something like we, that. You know, Socrates would say, well, you know, Steve, is it not, you know, is it not the case that the, um, uh, the awareness is a different thing than the green color blob? Or should we say that they are the same? Okay. How, how about, so <laughs> awareness is too hard. How about just the, the pure color blobness presenting itself? Mm, yeah. Yes. Um, is that, does that come uh, packaged with a concept? Um, well, so there is a question. And, and so one meta question here is how could we know any of these different things? I, I happen to think that there's a way to investigate them philosophically. I also think you can investigate them empirically. Uh, but so I, mean, I can tell you my, you know, the state of my current theories on the thing. Um, I currently happen to believe that the sensations themselves or the experience, the green color blob doesn't come with concepts. Um, but, it's always the case that the mind has to generate concepts or it has to apply pre-existing concepts so that the experience is conceptualized in some way. So it's, you know, and this is, this is an interesting sort of, you know, question that, you know, covered by, you know, rationalists and empiricists and so forth of whether all of your concepts arise from experience. Um, but anyway, it sounds like you want to take this somewhere. Well, yeah, I want to keep going down the rabbit yeah, hole, but sure, I actually sure, can sure. import this back into um, the philosophy yeah. of science. Okay, great. So one of the areas in which I think from my in, uh, investigation into the theory that I find lacking uh, mm -hmm. in contemporary times is interpretations of quantum mechanics. Oh, so there's yeah. particular okay. types of experiences that people are having in the laboratory, and then they explain them in a... Well, they, Sometimes they explain them and sometimes their explanation is that there is no explanation. Uh, right. And then they come up with concepts like, well, okay, maybe reality can be in no state at all or it's in a superposition of states, whatever that means. And I think, okay, some smells a little funky from the theoretical angle, though, yeah. the, though the practical knowledge, the techne of quantum mechanics is amazing and beautiful, it seems to be uh, profoundly lacking in the... Uh, theoretical dimension. So do, do you have, I don't know how deeply you, you, you've researched this. Do you have any thoughts on that, that area in particular and sure. in general that, that maybe the theory lags behind these experiences? Um, well, let's see. Yeah, sure. So I have some thoughts on that. It is really funny when you see, especially uh, science news reporting where, you know, people talk about quantum mechanics and say things that seem like they just, have got to be straightforward contradictions. So, you know, science, my favorite one is definitely scientists in Australia prove that reality doesn't exist. Oh, yeah. There's a million of those. <laughs> and so, like, <laughs> probably not. That's, that's, that's shocking. Um, uh, but so, I think that there's, there's actually a further concept that's really helpful and also part of, I think, how it's important to think about the progress towards truth um, as part of the scientific investigation, uh, sort of scientific enterprise or the intellectual enterprise generally. Um, a lot of people think that the intellectual progress is, it's like there's, there's sort of two different sides. Um, on one side, you have people who say that the thing that drives intellectual progress is the pursuit of the truth. And the things people are trying to do is they're trying to find true, true propositions. And when they find true propositions, those are the ones that people adopt. And so then there's this accumulation of knowledge of true propositions. Then you have people like Thomas Kuhn, book Structure of Scientific Revolutions, I think is excellent, um, where he goes through and catalogs all of these different ways that there seem to be things that aren't precisely aimed at the truth that are affecting the way that science works. And so you'll have people adopt a paradigm, even though the paradigm conflicts with some known existing evidence. And so then it's like the evidence seems to indicate that the relevant theories are not true. 
but nevertheless, it ends up getting adopted, and this is, you know, and ends up being very fruitful, and then scientific progress occurs. So then you have on one side people who think that, oh, so this this can lead you to think that, well, maybe the entire enterprise isn't related to the truth. Um, you have Kuhn, you know, concluding some pretty radical things at the end of his book. You've got paradigm incommensurability and anti-realism and so forth. Basically, maybe there's not actually a reality and we're not actually getting close to it, to simplify a bit. Um, I think that there is a middle way between these where I think that the, um, and I'm about to publish an essay on this topic, um, the, uh, but there's this concept uh, which i am uh, been using, which is the idea of an intellectual shelling point. So shelling points, you may be familiar with those. Um, this is basically a concept from game theory where uh, you have, if people can't talk to each other, could they still arrive, arrive at the same conclusions? There's like a, if you're in New York and you can't contact the other parties and you know that you need to meet, where do you go? Um, and then there's going to be, maybe it's Times Square because Times Square is the most sort of evocative um, available possibility and no one has any way to find any other possibility. And so then maybe you could have people um, end up with the same answer. That's the idea of a shelling point. But I think there's a type of shelling point that takes that is uh, relevant in the history of knowledge and in the history of science, uh, which is the uh, one that pertains to the pursuit of the truth. So I've been calling these intellectual shelling points. And the idea is that intellectual shelling points don't necessarily need to be true. In fact, they don't even need to be propositions. You could have an observation um, or a set of observations. You could have instruments. You could have theories, um, and uh, which would then be made out of propositions. The, the key thing is not whether they're true, but whether they bring in a whole bunch of, whether they attract researcher attention in a way that causes the researchers to all then be oriented on the mutual pursuit of the truth. Mm. So the, I mean, so like, if, for example, if you look at Euclid, right? So you're like, yay, Euclid, amazing. Um, was it true? So you're, you're a stickler for truth and you use the word truth in a particular way. So yeah. tell me, okay, Euclidean, uh, Euclidean geometry, true or false? False, emphatically false. Space is well, discrete. <laughs> yeah, space is <laughs> wow. Okay, you're going the space is discrete route. Yeah, um, and, and you know, if you, even if you didn't believe that space is discrete, you could maybe say that um, Euclidean geometry has been empirically refuted as the correct theory. If we at least if we accept general relativity, um, probably if you're going for discreteness, then you're going to reject a whole bunch of different things. But okay, well here's here's a puzzle for you then. Okay, given your you know statement that Euclidean geometry is emphatically false, okay. Well, first, was it useful in the development of knowledge? And, definitely. Okay, definitely. Um, and did that did that have nothing to do with the truth? So this is a fascinating question, and here's yeah. my attempt at answering this in particular yeah. because Euclid is fascinating me. It's like the, sure. it's one of the it's arguably the prettiest, prettiest <laughs> axiomatic deductive structure of knowledge that's ever been created. And it's wrong because the axioms are wrong. And this is really, this has puzzled me for a yeah. long time. Here's what I think, here's yeah. my attempt at answering that. For a few thousand years, there was not sophisticated enough or, yeah, sophisticated enough mathematics to deal with discrete uh, space. Okay. It was, it was too hard that, yep. and, uh, to, to assume continuity in mathematics is a fundamental assumption that goes back a really long period of time. However, recently, like there's a guy, there's a researcher I'm a big fan of in, uh, university of new South Wales, Dr. Norman Wildberger, who has discovered a way to reinterpret uh, mm -hmm. continuous mathematics through the discrete lens. And that he, he wouldn't phrase it this way. This he, is going to be a great example. Keep going. Keep yeah, going. yeah. So, so now I would say the, though the formulas are, are approximately correct that come out of ideas from Euclidean geometry, uh, there is a much more logically precise and concrete way to reinterpret them through the lens of discrete mathematics. So it's something like, 
it's something like you, uh, you, you asked is is the, the progress based on truth it's it's something like a they were almost right for a few thousand years but they didn't have quite the right level of logical rigor in order to get it all correct well, let me press you on yeah. so i think something like this is correct but but if, if you look at the details, I think there's something weird happening okay. where you say they were almost right. Do you mean almost in the sense that the, you just have to change the theory like in one small place and then it's right? <laughs> well, it depends on what you mean by one small place. So if, if, the, if the structure <laughs> is, is hierarchical, right, yeah. you might just have to change one little thing, but the one little thing's pretty damn near the bottom, which is okay. discrete, yeah. Okay, so so there's at least some sense then on your view in which Euclidean geometry was really quite far from the truth. Yeah, well, uh, from so, a okay. the, from a so, theoretical so, standpoint, yes. Yeah. If you're looking, if yeah. you're just trying to analyze the pure logic of the theory, it was very far away from the truth. Yes. Okay. Well, so and then this is perfect because then it's like I think we 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 recognize that there's something truth oriented about it even if you think that the thing is not true yeah. um, in like a strict and philosophical sense. Yeah. So this is where I think the idea of intellectual shelling points is really, really helpful. The thing that Euclidean geometry does, despite its flaws, is it causes there to be a common place for people's minds to go that make it so that even if they disagree with each other, they can all still work together. Mm. So you can you don't have to be a Euclidean, and you could still make an advance in Euclidean geometry, right? And it's and so the if you normally think about it like the like when you think about trying to get researchers to work together, this is something that's actually really quite difficult. Like imagine I mean, you've got a bunch of theories, you've spent a bunch of time trying to like get people to like adopt theories and so forth, and you'll know from your experience that it's super hard to do this. Right. Okay. Well, and, and then this is, if you think it's like, well, one of the problems is just that everybody disagrees, right? I mean, if we were in an area where we'd already figured out all the answers then we wouldn't need to, you know, then there wouldn't be a problem. Um, and so then there's this weird puzzle, which is how do you go about causing people to all work together on the same or similar problems, even though they disagree with each other? Mm -hmm. Um, and so then I think that there are certain things. So I think this is what's happening with Euclidean geometry. What's happening is it has a well-defined enough terminology, a, you know, explicit enough set of axioms. It doesn't even have all the axioms. Like the, people were disagreeing with Euclidean geometry really early on. In fact, the first construction where you create an equilateral triangle, um, there's just, you know, people were disagreeing that, I mean, there's the assumption that the um, lines don't intersect, for example, before they, you know, hit the, uh, that they intersect only once, for example. Um, and so there's all of these tacit assumptions, in, even embedded in Euclid's axioms. This doesn't get fixed until Hilbert, but that doesn't matter. I mean, it does matter in terms of actually getting the truth, but as far as being good enough to sync up researchers in a way that causes them to all focus on yeah, the truth. Yeah. Okay, but so, but so then to, to, to finish this point, the, I think, I mean, there's an interesting question. You talked about this mathematician who you really like. It might be really, really hard to come up with the relevant mathematics had a whole bunch of the original mathematics not been developed. And so I think the correct attitude to have towards the truth is that the discovery of the truth goes through many different points. And then each of the sort of waypoints or the you know, points you hit along the way aren't necessarily themselves literally the final truth, right. but they serve a coordination function and one that helps to orient the people's minds on the discovery of the truth. Yeah, I think that's a, a true and exciting point. And I would just say the, when you're talking about, uh, you said the, this is a, a progress of arriving at the truth and at no point necessarily uh, have we arrived at the full truth. I just wanted to make the point that all of these points along the way are discrete. They are not continuous. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have a few real things to say. Um, I, I'm finding this is a very exciting idea um, yeah. and I'm finding its application in religion. 
Mm-hmm. And so I grew up as a Christian evangelical, and, a, and that was very important to my parents to have that kind of training. And from my now perspective, I would call indoctrination and fell away from it and thought all these ideas are a bunch of nonsense. Well, recently, the past few years, I've been coming to it through a different lens, which okay. is to say, okay, if we just change one little thing, then suddenly religion makes a whole lot of sense. And mm-hmm. what if when people are talking about God, they're actually just talking about the universe, the whole thing all together. And suddenly, when you think about, well, there's a particular relationship you have with God. You are a part of God, and God is a part of you. Well, that's actually kind of true. And then you think, God is omnipresent. Well, yeah, the universe is everywhere, and God is omnipresent. So, it's what, it, it, so I'm, I'm approaching religion through this lens and finding all kinds of tr- certainly truth ideas that are profound in there. And then I look back on the religious indoctrination I got, and I thought, okay, you guys are, in a sense, a kind of getting at true conclusions. It's just mm-hmm. th- from the theoretical interpretation, it's all tortured and preposterous, where, where then they tell very elaborate stories about, the, about people, God is a person, and he came down, and he, had, you know, and he was nailed on a cross, and they tell all these very concrete things, and it's like, well, you may, act, you may be close but you're missing this one critical thing that if you get it right, actually the whole structure makes a whole lot of sense. Yeah. So, I mean, there's certainly, uh, so Spinoza, you may be familiar with, um, Spinoza has, you know, his book, the ethics where he tries to prove the existence of God, um, gives a proof, uh, gives multiple proofs and then attempts to, and then derives a whole bunch of the attributes and so forth. And you think, okay, well, you know, this is Spinoza believing in God, except that then a number of people think that Spinoza didn't really believe in God um, and that the word God was merely being applied in this case to the universe or something pretty close to the universe. Um, I think that it's a really good impulse to try to uh, preserve or reclaim as much of value as you can find in different traditions Um, I think especially for people, the traditions that they grew up in. So I think that that's super important. And then um, I think that the, there are going to be some things that you'd be able to preserve by means of this, but I I think that it doesn't, it's probably not going to get at the total core of the thing because I think (laughs) that, well, because I think that, uh, I think that religions uh, I mean, religions are super complicated. They have all these different parts, but one part of it pertains to the um, uh, way that you should relate to the rest of the world and the way that you should relate to other people and the way that you should relate to various experiences you have, concepts and so forth. Um, and then if you do this sort of transposition where you're like, oh, I see. Uh, but by God, we're referring here to the universe. Um, I would say there should just be an independent check on each of the, because what's going to happen is a lot of the practitioners, at least of the religions, um, are going to, the thing they're really going to care about is whether you're preserving the correct relations to everything right. else. Right. So right. you might, you might then say, so, so here's a question. If, you see yourself as part of the universe. Does that mean that you should have an attitude of piety towards the universe? Should parts have, what relation should parts bear to the whole? And so I think that, you know, with your focus on inference and getting the logic exactly right, I would propose that there is a further inference that needs to be made from the claim, I am part of the universe, to the claim, I should relate to the universe in a particular yes. regard. So yeah. I, th- I think that... Especially, you do- yeah, as mm-hmm. you go farther down the specifics, too, of it, they'll make prescriptions about culinary <laughs> intake. So it's like, yeah. oh, you have to relate to the universe with piety, which means you can't eat shellfish in this particular way. And I think yeah. they go off the rails. But actually, there was a little... There was one word that I think is critical here. You said the practitioners... Yes. will often focus. And now this is really fascinating. And, I, and, and I'm, I'm going to make a hierarchical claim. It yes. also seems to me that there's some, well, well this sounds impolite, but here we go. Uh, it seems to me that practitioners of, of religion t- 
tend to get things grossly incorrect in very uh, important ways and miss the, the many kernels of truth to be found in their religion so that they might focus on trivialities that don't matter and are probably wrong. However, it also seems to me that, that the practitioner's theoretical interpretation of their religion is different from maybe the people at the top level. So when I think about the philosophy of Jesus, and he's yes. talking about, don't you know that, you know, uh, uh, I, I am in you as uh, I am in my father or what, I, and he's talking, mm -hmm. I don't think he was speaking literally. I don't think Jesus as the philosopher was thinking, I am literally inside of you, right? And that's, that would be mm -hmm. kind of weird. I think he's talking metaphorically. And then there's a whole, maybe even the majority of people over long periods of time who then suddenly get this weird literal theoretical interpretation of what Jesus was saying, and then they develop rather ornate theories around the bastardization of the uh, of uh, what what some of the leaders maybe were saying, and what maybe what some of the higher level people were saying. From my elementary research into early Christianity, I do get the impression that there's maybe a little bit more focus on metaphor and embracing of metaphor and the non literalism that we get in in it, and maybe like, I don't know, the 1800s or something like that. So it seems to be rather hierarchical. You get the, the high mm -hmm. quality theoretical stuff coming out of some, a, a small amount of people. And then maybe the practitioners and the general public get things embarrassingly wrong. Well, I mean, at, at least I mean, sort of, there's, a, there's a sort of division of labor. I mean, you can think about, you know, you could, you know, accuse the adherence of either science or any religion and so forth of not really understanding the fundamental principles and so forth. And then you have to go to the higher ranks in order to get the, you know, the real, the, the sort of best arguments and the sort of best defenses of the relevant thing. So I, I think that that's, you know, obviously we want to strive for a world where people know everything or are specialists in everything or something like that. Um, <laughs> But until we are even remotely close to that, I think it, you know, I, I, this is something I tend to, you know, encourage people when they argue about religion or argue about science to not worry so much about what your average person on the street mm -hmm. says about the things. You want to go to the source um, and you want to go to the highest quality defenders of the relevant things. Um, now, it's an interesting question. I mean, we, we could dig in more deeply and so forth. You talked about over literalism and so forth. Um, the, uh, and then, I mean, all things considered, the Protestants have had substantially less time to develop their theology than uh, Catholicism has. Um, but, it, you know, and my knowledge of Catholic theology is limited. But I, from what I understand, I think there are you know, metaphor is something that is, you know, included in the proper ways to interpret uh, the Bible in accord, you know, so uh, I think that at least some religious traditions admit, yeah. um, admit of metaphorical interpretations of various things. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It seems to me that that's the, the thing that I'm, I'm looking at, having grown up in this, you know, yeah. extreme Protestantism is it's a mixture of anger and frustration because because it's like we were talking about before, where you can be a little bit wrong, but if you're a little bit wrong yeah. at the, fun, the fundamentals, your your whole thing is wrong. And I feel yeah. like some of these truths are so important and they're so <laughs> profound that to yeah. focus to focus on the you know the historical fact that that was there was a literally a serpent that made right. vocalizations in a garden. And that's important right. for you to believe. It's not just that that happened. It's that in terms of how you relate to the universe, you need to have this belief. Right. Uh, that's preposterous when you could just, there's so much truth that you can discover just about talking metaphorically. I do, I do want to return, if I can, to uh, um, some, uh, take it back to science here. Sure. Okay. So another reason I found what you said exciting about uh, the shelling, the intellectual shelling point idea, yeah. is it also seems to me that there is there seem there is a if you were to examine the shelling point, let's call it a, a particular theoretical narrative, and it could be about Euclidean geometry. I've, from my conversations, I've also discovered something delightful, which is 
at high levels, it mm -hmm. seems like people are aware that that shelling point is wrong. Yes. So, so I yes. think about like in mathematics, right? Yes. I, I, yes. when I was, dis so I, I started researching mathematics through logic and through philosophy because people were making all kinds of ridiculous claims that might even be logically contradictory, which brought me on this long journey. Yes. And then I dive into the history of mathematics and the philosophy of mathematics and start talking to some high quality mathematicians. And they go, well, look, the, the formal story is that mathematics is built on top of set theory. And right. there are 10 axioms in the Zernal frame, you know, ZFC set theory. Okay. Yeah. But then they say, yeah, but it's kind of a religion. It's not really some, it's, it's a story that we tell that gives structure to the mathematics that we're doing, but you don't necessarily believe all of the axioms. It's not like everybody has concluded that these axioms are true, which is not yeah. something you learn when you're just, when you're a student, when you're a PhD student and you're learning sure. the theory because you actually think it's true. Yeah, well, I think that this is, and it's it's interesting, I think, and this is something that I'm thinking a lot about, which is the relation between the authoritative use of knowledge and the or the function of authority versus the epistemic function, where there's an interesting thing about school, where when you're in school, you learn a bunch of things, and they tell you the things are true. Mm -hmm. And then maybe in the back of everybody's mind, they know that in 30 years, it'll be totally different. Okay, well, that's really interesting because the things are being taught as if they're true, but the professors and the students, maybe uh, at least a lot of people recognize that the epistemic status is not, we know that this is the case. The epistemic status may be something much more like these are our current best guesses and, you know, they're not exactly guesses. We have some evidence, but we recognize that the tools are really early on. And it could be that, you know, all this stuff ends up being changed after, you know, 20 or 30 years or something like that. But so I think that a lot of times when people are interacting with intellectual material, they, a lot of... Uh, you have to distinguish the authoritative use from the use that's designed to set you up as an epistemically uh, equipped agent. So imagine, you know, you've got a bunch of kids and they're learning math, you know, and they're like, all right, you know, the uh, four times zero is zero. And it's like, what's zero? <laughs> and you're like, well, uh, it's like nothing. It's like if you have like one, but you take it away. And the kid's like, so it's nothing. And the teacher's like, yes, it's nothing. It's like, how can you multiply a thing by nothing? If you multiply a thing by nothing, is it not the case that you are not multiplying? Um, uh, how, can there be be a, how can there be a relation between multiplication, um, uh, you know, a <laughs> relation of multiplication that itself has you know, a lack of a relatum, if I may use the Latin word, um, <laughs> the, the child says to the, the, the student. So the teacher at that point is like, look, just do your multiplication tables okay. Um, and notably, if the child doesn't do the multiplication tables, they may have this cool philosophical insight, but they're not actually going to be able to do the relevant math. So there's certainly a role for the authoritative employment of these sorts of statements where they're like, look, this is just how it is. Or they say, well, there's a proof somewhere. I don't know. You know, some important mathematician said so. That, that though, doesn't mean that when you actually go talk to the relevant people who have the best command of the things that they're going to. In fact, the, the people who merely receive the things authoritatively are going to have a lot more difficulty making really substantial breakthroughs. I think that if you accept a whole bunch of things authoritatively, you can make incremental advances, but you might receive, you might be in favor of challenging your assumptions, but it's too hard. You know, how are you going to figure out which assumptions to challenge? You, know, you received a thousand propositions. Are you going to challenge all of them at the same time? Well, then it could be anything. You don't know. Well, you'll just challenge a couple. Well, which ones? Well, you don't know, right? Well, so then I think that the people who... And, and so then I think that there's this difficulty figuring out when things are being advanced authoritatively versus when they're being advanced in a way that notes the 
actual epistemic status. Can I add one more thing on yeah, mathematics yeah. for this? So, so for example, the it's an interesting question what actually keeps mathematics together as a field. You could say, you know, so first, you know, naive view might be, well, they all believe the axioms. Okay, well, they don't believe the axioms. Okay. Um, we might say, well, they at least all agree that you can infer these things from these other things. Um, except that, you know, there you might then be tempted to say, well, what exactly are the, are, are the claims about? I mean, some of the mathematicians are going to be formalists uh, or they're just going to say, look, you know, so some you'll have are Platonists. And they'll say, we're talking about mathematical objects here. And then some you'll have believe that we're not talking about mathematical objects, we're talking about concepts. And then you'll have some who say, well, actually math is you have things written down. And then after we write down some things, then we write down other things. So the, the mathematicians don't have agreement at that level, but there is a cohesion inside of the field of mathematics that keeps it together. It doesn't actually split into the Platonists on one side and the formalists on another side. So that means that the thing that's actually holding it together isn't agreement on the propositions. Some of them are going to say, like, look, just look at the, you know, we have practices that we, after we write these things, we write these other things. Okay, but so then that then is a really interesting question. What is the thing that's holding the whole thing together? Okay, um, a, a few points. First, I think that's generally correct. Uh, uh, but in mathematics, there do seem to be structures of math that are built out that are unique to the uh, conceptualist school versus the Platonist school versus the formalist school. So, uh, for example, if you have an assumption about uh, processes existing outside of the mind, you might be more favorable to the axiom of choice, which sure. results in something like the Banach-Tarski paradox, which I would yes. say doesn't make any sense. Uh, <laughs> but if you have a different philosophical uh, uh, yeah. assumption, then you don't actually get some of those concrete conclusions in mathematics. Well, except for the fact that then you'll notice that only philosophers will say the thing that you just said. The mathematicians themselves will say, oh, well, if you're working in, you know, ZFC, then sure, you get the Banach-Tarski paradox, you know, Banach-Tarski paradox thing. Um, and, but they're not fighting about whether the things are true. Oh, well, that's not true, though. I mean, so this, this Weilberger guy I'm talking about. I, I, well, oh, and, sorry, 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 yeah, sorry. Yeah. sorry. Let, let, me, let me go meta on my own comment. Okay. The people, and this actually sort of, this, this, so this actually illustrates the idea of intellectual shelling points sort of really nicely. It's, there's something in math that's causing the people to be able to still work on the same problems um, or work on closely related enough problems, even though they disagree. So you could, uh, that was, uh, I would say that was a sort of uh, more operationalist gloss where when I say they don't, you know, they're, they're not making claims about what's actually true. It's, so that's, that's not right. So I think actually many of them will be making claims about what's true. Many of them will not be making claims about what's true. Many of them who make the claims about what's true will be making different claims about it. And the fact that mathematics can exist as a discipline mm. is with that taken into account is thus proof that mathematics is not staying together and mathematical progress is not happening because of that agreement. Mathematical progress is happening for a different reason, and it's because the axioms serve this intellectual centralization function. Mm. Yes, I, I would continue to add some small asterisk yeah. because it does seem like there are, there are minority schools of heretical mathematics which would say that the progress that's made that's built on some of these assumptions that are dubious aren't even something they can work with. It's like the, you, they, there's, it's garbage from their fundamental starting axiom. So there's a few areas in which there's nothing you can save. Though, yeah, and, yeah. And, and, and luckily, the coordination mechanism, the intellectual coordination mechanisms that hold math together are sufficiently strong that you can have people saying that yeah. inside the discipline and yeah. they still can get along oh. with each other. Oh, okay, so there's <laughs> two other things on this I really want to talk to you about. Um, one is when you, so there's, 
When we're talking about intellectual progress, one could look at the coordination of the practitioners. Yes. To the, what are the mathematicians doing? Well, the mathematicians are kept together by some intellectual yes. shelling point. There's another approach, which is to say the actual progress of the ideas. So, if, so just to illustrate the principle, if I were to talk about the, the progress that astrologers are making because they are unified around a particular shelling point and they're creating their various structures of knowledge, they're built on... Well, is that... It, well, but is, are there such intellectual shelling points for the astrologers? Are they I, I don't know anything about astrology. astrology. Well, so, but you, the thing is, this, this, there, there should be real examples here, right? Because... Well, math, I mean, some domains well, of math... This, is, this yeah. is exactly my point, which is that yeah. if we don't yet know the truth, or even if you use special philosophical methods, um, which I know you're a fan of, um, in order to figure out the truth in advance, um, then... You figured it out sort of well in advance of everybody else. Um, nevertheless, then the group hasn't figured the thing out. And there's this question of what produces the sequence of uh, steps that then results in the people mm. actually getting the answer. And so then I would say that, you know, in order, um, it would be a very interesting phenomenon if there were intellectual shelling points inside of uh, astrology that enabled the astrologers by their own lights to make progress. Um, so my current view is that if you look through and look at functional versus dysfunctional fields, the thing to look at is intellectual shelling points. Hmm. And so you'll, you'll have, and, and this is why you say, well, the thing to look at is the truth. So I think you're on the one side and I'll say that it's not the case that that's exactly the thing to look at. The thing to look at is related to the truth, but it's not the same thing as yeah. the truth. The, so you, you'll grant that there was progress in mathematics from Euclid on. <laughs> yes. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Despite your thinking that that's not literally the ultimate final answer as revealed by philosophy. Okay. Okay. And the practitioners themselves had all sorts of different views about, yeah. um, you know, what really was progress and what really wasn't. And so then my claim is this is the sort of the thing that's really puzzling about, um, advances in knowledge. We don't actually have the answers in yeah. a lot of cases. And so we can't use, the answer right. as the way to tell whether we're making progress. Right, right. And that, okay. that is unique to mathematics uh, and, and some areas of philosophy because by virtue of the domain, you're talking about uh, a subject matter in which you have all of the tools to know the truth if applied correctly. So like if you're talking about logic, for example, whether yeah. or not there are logical contradictions is something I think we can already, it's <laughs> unique in that we can know kind of once and for all. Yeah. So, I mean, I'm, you know, myself, uh, very partial to the idea that we can use logic and special philosophical methods. Like I think there's this like particular approach to philosophy that does yield knowledge. Um, but the thing that's notable is that like compare math and philosophy, for example. Um, so whereas both math and philosophy use logic. Okay. But, Math is very palpably making progress, and philosophy is making substantially less progress. Well, why is this? Okay, if it's if they're both using logic as the sort of means for making progress, right? Then there's this sort of important and interesting surprise in that the thing is working in mathematics and working substantially less well in philosophy. Well, I think that this has to do with this, is this intellectual shelling point idea, where there the you need something to cause the researchers to all work together enough to be able to error check each other and give each other feedback and all of the like benefits that come from collaboration mm. to get the views to the point of transferability. Mm. And I think that the intellectual shelling points like are substantially better in mathematics than they are in philosophy. Mm. So I don't, I, I don't think philosophy has made no progress. Um, people who have specific you know, philosophical views will look back and say, ah, this one philosopher said a really good thing in this one text. And then if you like look through the history of philosophy, you're like progress is being made because more good arguments are being hidden in the massive sort of, you know, mound of philosophical writing. Um, but I think that 
in looking at the accumulation of knowledge, you want to look at what the group ends up adopting. And I think there actually are a few examples in philosophy of things being widely adopted. Um, so one of them I mentioned before, this is the Hume point about us not perceiving causation and thus causation being something we conclude not merely from our experiences, but we, we have to try to infer to it or something like that. Another example, which also relates to induction, um, you may be familiar with Goodman's new riddle of induction. Mm -mm. Um, oh, it's so good. So um, the, uh, all right, well, so imagine, so let's, let's go through it. This is, this is a lot of fun. So imagine that, you know, you believe in induction and you have this bag of gems. So you open up the bag and you don't know what colored gems there are and you pull one out and it's green. Oh, is this the oh, group example? Yeah, 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 yeah. I didn't know the name of it. Yeah. Okay. okay yeah. No, this is Goodman's thing. Yeah. Um, so, but. Well, well, why, don't, why don't you go through it actually? Because yeah, it's a good case. Yeah. yeah. It's really fun. So, you know, so you pull out a gem and it's green. So you're like, okay, green. Okay. And then you pick out another gem and it's green. And you keep picking out gems. You pick out many, many gems and they're all green. Clock strikes 12. Now you're going to pick out another gem and you want to use induction well, induction is, you know, the idea that the future will resemble the past or that the superset resembles the subset or something like that the um and so because they've all been green so far you infer inductively that the next one will be green then some aliens show up and you're about to draw the gem out of the bag and they're like wait we got a prediction here and we predict that the gem is going to be blue. And you're like, well, that's obviously you know, contraindicated by the evidence. I have this long series of green gems that I've selected. And the aliens say, well, well, hold on here. Green, blue, these aren't our native concepts. We use this other concept, which we call GRU. Um, GRU means, uh, we've managed to figure out how to translate it. It means, um, in your language, green if before 12 o'clock and blue after. <laughs> now, all the gems that you have pulled out are both green and before 12 o'clock. And so they're grew. And so if all the gems have thus far been grew, then in you know using induction, it would stand to reason that the next gem pulled out would be also grew. But there's you know, the clock has struck 12. And so now a grew gem will be blue. Um, and so that means you should infer that the next gem you pull out should be blue, not green. And we used induction also. Okay. So then you think, um, okay, that's a problem. We're both using induction. Um, and if we're both using induction and we get different answers, what do we do about that? You might say, well, look, I have normal predicates though. I have, right. I have <laughs> Using green and blue, you're using these weird things. Grew and you know, grew. This is like obviously this made-up thing. Um, my predicate green is more basic. Um, you have to define grew in terms of green and blue in this particular way. And the aliens say, "Whoa, whoa, whoa! I mean, we were going to say the same thing to you. You have right. really weird, unnatural predicates, green and blue. We have the natural predicates, grew and bleen." Um, <laughs> Blue, of course, in your language, meaning green up until 12 o'clock, blue after. Blean, meaning blue up until 12 o'clock, green after. And so then we can define green as being grew until 12 o'clock and blean after. And we can define blue as being blean until 12 o'clock and grew after. <laughs> and so we're the one using the natural predicates, and you're the ones using these strange gerrymandered predicates. Okay, so that's the so then that's the new riddle of induction. The upshot from that is even if you just grant as an assumption that induction works, you uh, you can have opposing predicates such that if you do induction on the same set, you get different answers. And so then, you know, maybe you conclude induction doesn't work. Maybe you conclude that there is some special way of picking out what the correct predicates are that you can do induction on. But at least it's you know not a not trivial to figure out what follows even if you grant that you're allowed to use induction mm -hmm. okay so, cool well, so, yeah. then, so then to um you know bring this back the 
So Goodman's new riddle of induction, I think, is broadly accepted by philosophers. Not the answer, but that there is an uncertainty. And then if you try to figure out, like once you get into this perspective of intellectual shelling points, what's causing people to sync up, then there's this interesting question of what are the intellectual shelling points inside of philosophy? I think that one, uh, at least a partial answer to that, is that people can recognize where they don't have answers, at least some people can recognize, and there's all sorts of things you can do to cause people to recognize that they don't actually have answers. And if you imagine all of these people who are trying to find the places where the answers are the least solid, then that, I think, is one of the things that attracts people into philosophy, which, which means that, and that's not like a full account of what philosophy is, but I think that's an important part of it. Then you can look at, like, I think this helps to explain philosophical progress in the sense of, like, in terms of what things get adopted uh, and what things don't get adopted. I think that Hume's observation about causation uh, or his claim about um, causation not being perceived was largely adopted. I think that Goodman's view was largely adopted. Very, very little is largely adopted in philosophy. But both of these things are examples of things that we don't know. They're saying, you thought you knew this, but actually you don't know this. Here's how you can tell that you don't know the relevant mm -hmm. thing. Mm -hmm. So then I think that philosophers actually have a much more substantial ability to sync up with regard to knowledge of what we don't know. Well. It, it appears to me we don't know a whole lot, right? Yes. So well, that, you're, you're a philosopher. You, you, you have been attracted by that fact. I, I suppose, but it seems like a hard pitch to tell people. I, I, guess, I guess I suppose if, you're, if the set of people you expect to coalesce around these shelling points is very small, uh, I guess that's not a concern. But the, the more I learn, the more I'm going, oh, okay, well, we just there's all kinds of reasons why we just don't know very much almost but it, see it would actually be easier to say we don't know anything that would be the nice yeah. position like oh okay finally i understand we don't know anything that, that unfortunately we can't even take that position here because we do right. know a few things or exactly well so then this is this is <laughs> i mean i think this is when you think what leads there to be successful fields versus not it has to be that the fields allow people to come together and think together despite disagreement, because the, that's the whole point of the field is to work the thing out. If you, there wasn't any disagreement, um, you know, you would, maybe you wouldn't even need to do that. But so then I think that the, um, in mathematics, you have, you know, common language, um, uh, methods for checking whether something follows from something else. Uh, you have commonly accepted axioms, course, you don't actually need to accept them. Um, it, they happen to be fruitful if you follow these methods that we can show you how to follow or we can show <laughs> enough people how to follow. Uh, then philosophy doesn't have that. There might be things in philosophy that have been discovered, but this wouldn't be a case of knowledge accumulation because for it to get to the level of uh, it, in order for it to accumulate, there have to be enough people all able to look at and uh, interact with the same right. phenomenon, which is why I think in philosophy, knowledge uh, of what we don't know has more of a tendency to accumulate than, for example, like suppose right. that the claim that space is discrete uh, is actually true. Um, that claim has been being made for a while. There's a bunch of different philosophers who make it, and yet it's not really sticking exactly. Uh, and that's because philosophy is this area that draws in all the people who have you know, who are recognizing the sort of higher levels of confusion. Yeah, well, I, I mean, I would also play, lay part of the blame here on the mathematicians. There's, I'm fascinated by the history of philosophy because, I'm yeah. sorry, the history of uh, mathematics, well, the history of philosophy as well, but uh, uh, there has been a consistent story, which is that the mathematicians come up with a useful and fruitful formula uh, yes. that, that is logically ungrounded, the, the the contemporary mathematicians at the time of that invention go, no, no, it's fine. It's good enough. Come on, look at all these great things we can do with it. The the philosophers and, and strict logicians went out to make better arguments. And then like a hundred years later, there's some update 
to the fundamentals and they go, oh, well, actually, yeah, those criticisms were right all along. But now we know that mm -hmm. calculus is on sound foundations until the next, you know, 50 years from now, people will realize, well, actually, calculus isn't, still isn't on sound foundations. Well, right, right. But I think what's happening is you're, you're, you're tracking, you're, you're tracking the question of whether the people have gotten the truth. And the thing I would say is that despite the sort of repeated recognition that the thing isn't on solid foundations, yeah. progress is still occurring. Okay. So my, so my challenge to you is how would you explain progress occurring despite the fact that the foundations are not set up properly? How would I explain it? Uh, it well, yeah, because because you, you could imagine a, a, you know, an argument that said, well, in order to make progress, you have to have truths and be building on truths. Um, but you think the people don't have truths and are not building, you don't think they're building on truth. Yeah, it, so it, I think you should conclude that they're not making, but to put this more, you know, uh, I don't know if this is, actually represents your uh, position, but, you know, to argue it, um, it seems like you should you should say that they're not making progress, um, and I think that they are making progress. Well, it, it depends on what the goal is. So but, if the goal is is okay. So yeah. Wait, wait. yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. And then and then <laughs> I think there's a way in which you suspect that they are getting closer to the actual truth. I, I, okay, here's here's my best guess right now. Yeah, they are mining valuable gems that will eventually be polished and refined into yes. the truth by future yes. thinkers. Yes. Yes. That, yes, that, and, <laughs> and you'll notice that that's what happened in every successful science. Is right. that the so, case? I don't, I, is I mean, that so, the claim? Yeah. 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 So think, so, so, you know, you could look, I mean, you know, we're looking at the history of electricity right now. People will know more about the history of physics. Right. But so, you know, the, so in physics, for example, are we at the final physics? No. Okay. How do we know that? Because general relativity and quantum mechanics have not been reconciled. Okay. So then quantum, even quantum mechanics and general relativity are themselves in a way these not yet fully polished gems. There's still something in there, <laughs> right? And so I think the, you know, noting where the things are logically inconsistent or haven't been reconciled or the foundations aren't set up help to remind people that we're not yet there. Mm. Um, but I think that what's happening is we're accumulating value and getting closer along mm. the way. Okay, so a personal question, and then I want to ask you one more yeah. critical question about from a systemic standpoint. So uh, the personal question is how, how do you deal with the state of believing that the foundations are not set up and there are internal contradictions within our greatest theories of physics and and not get bothered by that. I'm still in the state, uh, I, I'm still in this horrible state of thinking, okay, I'm some dude on the internet who happens to be curious about various things. And I yeah. think that general relativity and quantum mechanics are wrong. And I think part of the reason they're wrong is because space is discrete and that actually sure, solves sure. a bunch yeah, of problems. Yeah. But yeah. But, but I listen, I, I, I consume content, I listen, and I'm curious, I go, this is, I know this is wrong, I know this is wrong. And I know nobody will listen to me, because it yeah. sounds preposterous, but I still have a, I think, a rather justified belief that in a, in a whole bunch of areas of thought, the foundations are poor, which means a lot, some of the conclusions are poor and backwards. So how do you deal with that yeah. on a personal level? How, do you not, how are you not angry by that? <laughs> well... Is, do you feel frustration? I, um, no, no. I, I mean, I'm trying to remember. I definitely, like many years ago, had many, many arguments with people on many topics and found it to be sort of, uh, sort of shocking how hard it was to communicate certain types of things. Um, but since then, I've spent a lot of time thinking about what the overall process towards knowledge looks like, as well as things that can help to make it faster. Um, and then, and, and I definitely, and so something like I've come to understand why a lot of the things are the way they are, mm. um, while at the same time, and I'm still think that there are ways we can do things much better. But so for example, 
um, the take this idea about the discreteness of space and a sort of a particular logical approach to answering particular philosophical questions. And imagine that we're in the world where that's actually right. Well, we're not in a world where it's right and lots of people can tell right now that it's right. Okay, well, what do we do about that on a practical level? I like the shake your fist at the sky approach. That's what I've been doing. No, but think, I mean, that, that, that's from the perspective of like an individual citizen. Now, now okay. occupy, <laughs> occupy the perspective of like a sort of responsible uh, sort of governing person okay. entity or something like that, where imagine you're in charge yeah, of yeah. knowledge in the world. So here's the thing that I'm doing, which yeah. I'm sure is not the correct thing to do. It is to yeah. try to articulate the failures of the contemporary paradigms to say, oh, actually still these yes. stories that are told about calculus do not pass logical right. muster. Yeah, so, and so I think that that's obviously a useful function. But now, again, I want to invite you out of like the sort of citizen role for a moment, okay? And imagine that you're actually designing a system of knowledge for the world, okay? Like th this is an important, like yeah. very important point because uh, you'd say that knowledge is powerful. Sure. Knowledge is very valuable. Yeah. Okay, lots of people should have knowledge and we want everyone to have knowledge. Yeah. Okay. Um, but it's difficult for people to tell what's true. Mm -hmm. Even in many cases after the things have been explained. Um, and then this, you know, there's a whole bunch of different reasons for this. Um, so then there's a question of what, what do you do about this? So should you, for example, um, you could say, well, I, you know, as Steve Patterson in charge of knowledge distribution um, for the Western world, let's say, um, recognize that the discreteness of space is correct, therefore promulgation. Um, and so you press the button and now everybody believes it, right? Or at least you teach it authoritatively in schools. It's true that most of the people can't understand why that's the case. In fact, only a very, very small number can recognize this. Okay, but they're told anyway that they should accept this. Does that sound like the right answer? Uh, uh, well, so it, it it depends, I guess, on how closely connected you you see humans. So, like, I in my yeah. my running theory about the world is is there are there are a few isolated minds that get it and get to, that understand things maybe at a higher level and just get to sit back and bask in their greater understanding of the world and that's the end of the story. There is no button pushing. There is no, there, there's no mechanism for getting those ideas out in a way that people understand them. Yeah. I mean, so I, I think that if you think about how you would actually set up a system to deal with the, uh, like the, there's a whole bunch of different challenges. But so I think, for example, um, if you have a type of knowledge that is only accessible to a very small number of people, and it can't be more widely replicated or checked, then you're going to have to answer the question, well, why should we listen to these people? Now, of course, those people will be saying, well, it's because we're right. Okay. But <laughs> the other people can't tell that that's true. Right. And so you could say, well, we should listen because we will imbue those people. We will give them military force. Those people will have, you know, we should listen to them because they are in control of, uh, you know, worldwide military, you know, something like that. OK, you could say, well, no, we don't want that. We want to um, what we're going to do is we're going to have a system of general deference to, you know, uh, thinkers. Um, and these thinkers, even though people can't tell that they figured out a thing. We're going to have people defer to them. I mean, that I think that's going to rub you the wrong way. Yeah, also. sure. Okay, okay. So then, um, but from because what know, they're wrong, by the way, because like historically, the people would be in the well, positions of power, and they would be wrong. That's well, the reason about it. But what if the people were were right, and you had to have? So this is this is. And I think this maybe you know is an interesting question because I know you have at least some libertarian sympathies. Um, there's an interesting question here where. I think that the thing that's happening in physics, for example, or mathematics, where you have 
people coalescing around much more shareable and recognizable um, shelling points that uh, essentially allow them to check each other and et cetera. Um, I think that that system is in a way substantially more accessible than a system that had uh, you know had it set up so that we would listen to people who could um, work out the truth, but we couldn't tell whether or not they'd actually worked out the truth. Mm. Does that make sense? Yeah. I, I also, I, I guess I, in thinking through this thought experiment, yeah, I don't have a clear uh, understanding of the value of other people discovering the truth. Like it's extremely, Extremely important for me to try to discover the truth, and it and it, dire it directs how well, I live. But I'm not actually sure how far that extends to other people. Well, if if that's true, why are you frustrated um, when you find that other people don't have the relevant truths? It seems like maybe you do have some concern for whether they have the truth. I, I do have. Uh, so it's it's twofold. One is sometimes they get in my way, right? If they have bad political ideas, <laughs> or, sure. or or even bad cultural ideas, as I navigate the world. I don't yep. want to be stepping on porcupines. And the other is, yes, yeah, some type of empathy. I think people cause a massive amount of uh, pain to themselves that's ultimately based in confusion, and I don't like that. Yeah, I mean, this is... So I, I, I completely agree with you that there's tons of unnecessary pain that comes about as a result of confusion. And then there's just a question of how do you structure a... You know, on a smaller scale... There's how do you structure research programs, and then on a larger scale, there's how do you structure societies to be able to engage in this process of intellectual investigation and discovery. And so I think that the um, as like a, a sort of you know more like a sol a solo investigator, um, uh, it makes sense that you know you would look into methods that only a very small number of people, even if, if the methods work, only a small number of people have ever been able to use them. Mm. Right. And so then, but then in terms of thinking about what's happening in these other disciplines, I think, uh, a thing to look at is like, look at the size of the disciplines, look at the total number of people involved, right? If you have, you know, a hundred people, and maybe if you have two people or three, you know, given the current state of like, take, your favorite philosophical method. Or maybe you could get two or three people synced up on it. Okay. But if I give you, you know, 10, you know, smart, able, honest, you know, et cetera, philosophers, it's gonna be really hard for you to get them all to be synced up on the same method. Right. And so then what one way to think about this intellectual shelling point idea is to look at the number of people it's able to sync up into a research program. And so I would say that the research program size that can be supported by your favorite philosophical methods, TM, is going to be actually really small, whereas the size of the research program that can be supported by Euclid's elements mm -hmm. is actually really large. And that's true even though Euclid didn't have a full axiomatization that, mm -hmm. you know, you know, it's non-discrete and, you know, Empir maybe empirically disconfirmed by, uh, you know, modern physics. Okay, so uh, the, the other question I wanted to ask you about the intellectual shelling point idea is, uh, you have spent your time um, thinking about a lot of things and engaging with various people at high levels, um, more in the academy that I have, right? My engagement with people in our contemporary academic paradigm is a lot of interviews on their show, some personal yeah. conversations throughout the years, but I imagine in terms of gross numbers, you've probably engaged with more than I have. And mm -hmm. uh, my observation, I wonder if this is correct or not, is that <clears throat> if you were to line up a hundred PhDs uh, who've, who've, who've gotten their PhD, not PhD students, because this would number would be yeah, worse sure. with them, a hundred people who are certified doctors yeah. of X, Yes. And ask them about the, let's say, the axioms of their discipline. Yes. A large percentage would be so uh, early in their intellectual research as to believe the axioms are true because that's what they were taught in school. 
And however, a small amount of really high quality minds would get it. They, mm -hmm. they would totally understand that, you know, these are uh, the, par the current paradigms are definitely wrong when we're talking sure, about big sure. things like. Uh, so, so if I were to put numbers on it, I would say just in my, you know, you, you go to a faculty, like I actually had to do this when I was traveling around interviewing people is I would go to the faculty pages of universities that I was in proximity to yeah. and try to find high quality researchers. So I would go through and like, do a little bit of reading and look at their CV and be like, oh, this person's guaranteed to be terrible. This one's terrible. And I would try to find the really good ones and I would still sometimes be grossly underwhelmed. So I, I would look at it something like nine out of 10, eight out of 10, maybe more than that. Uh, don't even grasp that their, their, the, the paradigm and the sharing point that they're working around is definitely wrong. Do you think that's an overestimation? Um, I think that if you, we'd have to get the sort of the claim exactly right, but I, I definitely think that a very large proportion of people in the fields don't recognize importantly recognize the epistemic quality of the material in the fields so i, I put it like that so to um, make it more concrete yeah. like in mathematics the majority of mathematicians that one encounters actually maybe even more so in math than other disciplines i'm not sure but the majority of your average mathematicians uh are not going to have deeply thought about the epistemic status of ZFC set, set theory. They're not even, they might not have even yeah. entertained the idea that those things might be completely wrong. Um, yeah, so I think that most of them will not have looked into it deeply. Um, it's an interesting question how many will have had one day, you know, hmm, I wonder if the axioms are, you know, in fact not fruitful or in fact, you know, incorrect. Do they match reality? Are there Platonist objects that match them, et cetera? Um, I'm not really sure about that percentage. Uh, but it's it's notable that I actually think that it's good that most of the people aren't especially fixated on that point. Like if I could, I would want to have many or most of the people clued into the you know, epistemic foundations question and so forth a bit. But it's sort of like, you know, there's currently an intellectual division of labor. And so you know, and you want to have people making progress on the fronts that where you actually can make progress. In some cases, the um, you're going to end up getting progress from attempts to push the cutting edge of the functional research program, rather than critiquing the relevant research program. So, like a good example is Newton with um, the perihelion shift of Mercury. So Newtonian physics has this nice counterexample, which is the way that the orbit of Mercury around the sun shifts on its axis over the course of time. Newtonian physics doesn't explain it. This was known well before we got relativity. Relativity explains it better. But you don't want to have all the physicists drop everything and then mm. try to figure out what to do with the anomaly. You mm. want some of them doing that. Mm. And then you want the others pushing regular Newtonian physics forward. And so the thing that I would say for your particular like research program or angle on this is I would suggest that you want there to be enough people trying to examine the foundations, um, enough people trying to um, uh, uh, figure out uh, whether the relevant philosophical methods are right and so forth mm. rather than everyone. So like the, the focus on the percentage, I think is yeah. not the correct focus. I think, the thing you want to ask is, is there a high quality, probably small, which is the right size for it, research group that's working on this right now? And if not, then there's a question, why not? Maybe it's too hard to form one of those. Um, but that's, that, that would be the place to look rather than causing everyone to be concerned about this right now. Okay. How do you deal with the following observation that hmm. there are various domains in which as a result, I think, of the lack of rigorous foundations, uh, people end up profoundly getting harmed. And I think of nutrition research uh, as an example. Like my wife has, has I think, c come into some pretty high quality th theoretical concepts 
about human health and nutrition. And if, yeah. if her theory is correct, then mm -hmm. the contemporary paradigm, medical establishment included, is way off base and probably harming people yeah. a lot. So, yeah. I, so I look at that and I think, okay, well, that's because their, their philosophy is totally mistaken. They think, I would even put it in terms of uh, like metaphysics, right? They're, they're, they're not recognizing that objects are not isolated from one another. They come bundled with relations and this part of the system, the body system affects this part of the system, which affects this part of the system. So sure. when you intervene, you actually can cause a bunch of problems yeah. that you didn't see. So, so how do you deal with that objection to say we need more rigorous foundations? Look at this example of nutrition science. Yeah. Well, I mean, uh, this is, I, I think that this is why these things are so important. I think that we absolutely need to make a bunch of different changes in order to improve the quality of the research that's happening. And then the question is, and, and, and from the perspective of the final completed science of nutrition, I think that a bunch of the things wrong in the foundations are going to like uh, will have been responsible for people giving bad recommendations and people not knowing what to do with their health. And I think so. But then there's a question of what do you do about this, where most of the researchers just aren't aren't equipped to challenge the foundations themselves. Um, and so thinking that that's the sort of point of intervention. So it's like, I agree with the problem. And then the question is, what's the correct point of intervention? I think the, the correct point of intervention here and nutrition, you know, so I study early stage science. There's this question of how do you, how do successful sciences get started? And I think that nutrition, um, or I'd say even more generally health is a really good place to look. Um, the, my guess is that the problem uh, is going to not be as much a failure to build up from rigorous foundations as opposed to a different problem, which is um, not having as many researchers build generalist models in a way where they can all then check against each other and improve mm -hmm. the generalist models. So my guess, I don't know, but my guess is that... Um, in you know the case of your wife and, and nutrition, like trying to figure out what's happening there, it wasn't an attempt to actually derive everything yeah, out no, from that's true. principles. Um, but it, but it, what it was was a substantially more generalist approach that tried to then take. So it's like, okay, why do we have in a bunch of cases like less than stellar advice coming to us from the medical establishment? Well, it's because in a lot of cases, they don't have the answers. Okay, why do they not have the answers? Well, a lot of people would love to get the answers. You got a lot of well-motivated people, and you know, and somebody who figures out the true theory of health will also get status and prestige and all of that. And so um, people like to say, well, it's incentives. There's like more to be said there. But I think the thing I'd say is that um, there really aren't well-established methods for approaching things in a generalist way. So this is something that we see as we examine the history of science. Early on, people are much more, there's a transition that happens from the early stages where you have substantially more generalism through to the late stages where the thing is specialized and precise with an established terminology, with an established set of methods that you can use. And so I suspect, and there was an absolutely enormous increase to the total amount of funding that went into academia and scientific research over, you know, since World War II, the last 75 years. And I think that if you add so many people like that, it's a pretty difficult thing to ask for, to ask for all of them to invent new methods and et cetera. But with so many people, it's really likely that the thing that will happen is that people will try to find methods that are much more established, much easier to agree upon. Mm -hmm. And so then the, my current guess as to what's happening here, and this is something I expect to research over the next little bit, um, but my guess is that you have a very large number of people doing research using established methods, and you have substantially fewer people doing research in a way that matches 
what happens at the early stages of the development of sciences, where people are, you know, developing theories with less standardized terminology, mm -hmm. um, doing things that are qualitative rather than quantitative. It actually takes a long time for a field to get to the point of being able to be quantitative, developing instruments that relate to the theories. Um, like we've got a whole bunch of really advanced instrumentation to help us understand what's happening in people's bodies. Um, but we don't have like a health meter. We can't like mm. point at the person and be like, okay, your health score is 72. Right. And that's because we don't have theories about what that is. And, and so then I would suggest that the real problem isn't building up from the foundations. The real problem is um, not having, uh, basically having, not having enough research effort going into the um, development of early instruments, development of generalist models and things like that that would specifically aim to have us understand things like health. I think that's largely correct. Though I guess I would say when I'm thinking of building things up from sound foundations, I'm not necessarily proposing that we come up with a, a full and complete metaphysics of health <laughs> before we discover anything. It's more like it's more of a methodological point that if you're the correct uh, approach to health research is one that recognizes the value of the generalist model. So it would be the one that recognizes the complexity of the discipline and how when trying to gain knowledge about health, we have to rely on anecdotal experience. And we have amazing oh. tools about getting higher quality data for, you know, on the internet at a, at a low level. So it's like a methodological point about approaching it from the yes. right mindset. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and so there, I think this is the sort of place where you have to separate the, there's the question of how do you acquire knowledge and there's a question of how do you fix bureaucratic systems. These are, are two separate things, but like if you just all of a sudden had, um, you know, practitioners sort of open the floodgates so that they would now listen to a lot of anecdotal evidence, then, well, then you're going to end up with a lot of variation in recommendations that comes out of that. And then how does that fit with our legal system? Somebody gives a recommendation on the basis of, okay, well, so you could say, well, we need to fix that. Well, yes, definitely we need to fix the things, but let's separate the problems, right? So one, this is why I think that I'm most optimistic about there being special research groups and teams that make progress in uh, sort of like they would make progress with this sort of generalist type model and get it to a point that it was then po it, that it, it then became possible to spread more widely. It, it's something like, again, this has to do with looking at, I guess there's a simple model on which you'd want every researcher to be looking at every question. Um, but I think actually the researchers, it's something like you want to have the right design for research programs. So, so take mathematics again. Um, the, before Euclid, the, I'm check this, I'm pretty sure Pythagoras predates Euclid. Um, the, you got a whole bunch of different methods for people coming up with mathematics. Um, but the, it's not something that's nearly as shareable, right? So you had Pythagoras's group, they were all on a boat, they were all, you know, special, you know, methods for eating, a special method of life, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and that, you know, there you have a small group that's more tightly coordinated that then is going to be able to share information internally better, hmm. um, Whereas, and that's because you don't have the axioms. As soon as you get to Euclid's axioms and postulates and so forth, then it becomes possible to loop in way more people. Mm -hmm. And so I, I think like this, this, the same thing is you know, true for, um, and we said we're studying the history of electricity. It's like pretty hard to study, the, to study electricity early on. You've got like weird objects occasionally attracting each other, yeah. like a whole bunch of like, you know, people saying that diamond attracts this and amber attracts that and so forth. And the lodestone attracts in this way. And the lists are frequently wrong and nobody, you know, and then you get to a point where William Gilbert publishes 
this book in 1600, where he talks about this device, the versorium, which is essentially this needle that you can put down and allows you to pick out electric attraction. Before you have that, hmm. it's at least like makes sense that it would be substantially harder to sync up on things. Mm -hmm. After you have that instrument, it's easier to sync up. So you could imagine in the case of health, like a very late stage device is we've got our healthometer where we, you know, scan the person, we see how healthy they are. And you're like, how does that make sense? Is health even the sort of thing that admits of a theory? Well, <laughs> according to the advanced theory that we'd have at the time, health would have four components and you scan <laughs> them in the following way. But it's obvious we don't have that. And we're not gonna produce that next. The thing that would happen way earlier than that is that we would have a less good instrument and before that an even less good instrument. But the development of instruments helped to make the, the discoveries and theories and so forth much more transferable. So I guess what I'm saying is the mm -hmm. thing that we should expect to see in the development of any new field, anytime you look at a field and you're like, this isn't working properly, you want to look to see, is this the sort of thing that in the true story of how it came to work properly, it makes sense to imagine that it would go through a sequence of people develop initial theories. There's lots of disagreements. Someone comes up with an instrument. A lot of people coalesce on the instrument. It refutes a bunch of theories. Someone develops a new theory. There's lots of testing. A bunch of anomalies are discovered. You get a new instrument. And then eventually we have the healthometer. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, uh, coming to a close here, we've already gone a little bit over time, so I appreciate yep. you being generous here. Sure. When you are looking at the big picture of scientific progress or knowledge production at present, yes, do you think, in general, you know, we're at the peak, right? There have there hasn't been a higher point that we've we've been before, yeah. and I'm generally yeah. optimistic and thinking, okay, well, we've done a pretty good job. Or do you look at it and say, okay, though we may be at the peak, like if you're looking at the exponential uh, curve of how these things should accumulate, we're like right at the bottom and things are really terrible right now. Uh, my, of course, oh. my orientation is I, I generally look at the state of knowledge production and think, oh, it's, yeah. it's terrible, but, but you've done more research than I have here. Um, I would say that it's like overall very good in terms of the you know in terms of world history uh and then i would go on a field by field basis basically yeah, yeah. Um, and then i would look at um whether the field is itself an early field or a late field i would look at whether the people are using the sorts of methods mm -hmm. that should be used at the relevant stages i'd look at whether incremental advances are the right things versus whether we need paradigm shifting revolutions. Um, and, and then I think that my scorecard comes out pretty similar to what I think a lot of people believe where it's like the hard sciences have done really well. The soft sciences have not done nearly as well. The one place where I'm, I am very optimistic is that I think that in a lot of different places where there hasn't been much knowledge accumulation, I think that in those cases, there have been advances in the past that just haven't managed to become part of a standing tradition. Mm -hmm. um, and so there have been discoveries without accumulation. That's one thing. Um, and then I'm just also optimistic that we could make a lot more progress. Yeah. One area that I've just recently discovered and, and, and flattering my curiosity that I've been surprised where I look at the structure of knowledge, I go, damn, this, this is actually pretty good. The only one I felt that way is chemistry. As, as part of the reason I've, I've just been consuming yeah. uh, chemistry content and I think, okay, there's this really combina interesting combination where you don't have to have the fundamental theory like Yep. At the base level, we don't have physics sorted out, so we can't have chemistry yep. sorted out. But there's a there's a, enough of a of a, a low barrier to entry where anybody can order the right chemicals online. Sometimes yes. in a legal gray area, they can <laughs> literally in their garage or basement, or whatever, do these experiments themselves to confirm the results. And that happens. There are all these basement chemists out there that are doing that. And I'm thinking, wow, that's really that seems really unique and awesome to me. It's not so yeah. with physics, right? You can't just build your large hadron collider, you know, and like experiment things in your in your basement right now to that level. Yeah, I mean, it sounds like something you're really excited about is the democratization of the process where yeah. people have the ability to check the things themselves. Um, 
I, I like that. I think that, I mean, it's an interesting question because you have to ask how much you really want people building things in their basements, like to some <laughs> degree. Um, like, you know, there's new synthetic biology capabilities and do we want people to have the ability to synthesize absolutely anything? Sounds like no. Um, but I do think having people have the ability to check things seems really good. One idea I really liked uh, was you could imagine having some sort of substantially more accessible to the public. It's not exactly like a museum, but it'd be more like a cross between a museum and a lab or something like that, where you could go in and look at something like reconstructions or replications of all of the progress that occurred across history mm -hmm. so that you can see like here's the original experiment that helped us to distinguish mag uh, magnetism from electricity and here's the experiment that was done that showed that franklin's theory of electricity was wrong and here's the and and sort of do the whole thing from the perspective mm -hmm. of uh the people who are making the discoveries along the way so that not only would you have the ability to check but you would understand why it was that each of the changes had occurred. I think that that would, uh, the checking function is good, but I think we also want people to understand where all the things came from. I think that's a, uh, that's a really cool idea. I would pitch that to somebody and uh, I would definitely attend. I would be an early <laughs> attendee of that museum. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> all right. Hey, this has been a great conversation, Jeff. Yeah, I appreciate your time. Yeah. Yep. I really enjoyed it. All right. Bye.